Do we ask that every time? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Welcome to the Medevac Podcast, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Our guest today, Deanna Wheeler. There she is. Combat veteran. Yes, sir. And country music star. Trying to be. Trying to be. Okay. Soon to be. Oh, yeah, I think I think you qualify as R. And yeah. country. I mean, you got and your and own CD drinker. right here. Come I do. on. I do. Ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Can my, you my... sing us a tune real quick? Come on. So I can sing you the beginning of this one. <laughs> Pull up a seat and let me pour you a drink. Take another shot of some dive bar therapy. It's whiskey weather. <laughs> we need to put whiskey in our coffee today. Oh, yeah. Well, we you know, it's funny too. enough, I think we got some whiskey right here. I know. Here. So, Tell us about this. Is. So this What's is an on? interesting, this is called the first seductive whiskey. It's called Oil Fire. And it's a rye whiskey that, honestly, it's not what they like preach about it, but it's a rye whiskey that women like. Mm. Like, it's almost like a refined fireball mixed with like, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. It's bizarre. I but heard it's it tastes so like good. maple syrup. It does have a mapley taste to it. It's just, it's so unique and different. <laughs> and it and it is actually pretty damn good in coffee. I'm we're not going to lie. We're going to try this? We're going to break it open right now? Let's break it open. I know. It's such a little tiny <laughs> model. That's a little <laughs> bottle. We don't have rules here. There's, no, no, rules. there's no rules. Dave is trying little, to yell at us over little, there. Pull a little dab in my coffee oh, and you guys yeah, can swig away. Oh, there Let's we go. Oil fired. Let me read this real quick. Maple syrup, actually. America's first it's interesting, like right? seductive handcrafted spirit. Seductive. Oil Ooh. fire. He Blood. sounded like he was doing the, the commercial for In it a right world. now. <laughs> In a world. So, so tell us this. A, a lot of people, uh, for your fans out there, do they know that you're a combat veteran? Most of them do. Some of them in which, like, actually know I'm a combat veteran and then I do a lot of nonprofit stuff and then they go, oh my God, you sing country music? I'm like, <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> exactly. You so it's also been, sing country music? Right? Yes. They, some of them didn't even have any idea and actually a lot of my, my fans or my friends or just supporters had to be when I was in the hospital three years ago with Guillaume Bray. Hmm. So I got a lot of support then and then those people are the ones who didn't actually know what I did for a living. Really? Because that was like, I had started my music career and then it died when I had Guillaume Bray, or so I thought. Naturally. And, you know, it was just, it was a different group of people that were like, hey, we believe in you. I had thousands of messages being like, oh, my grandma had that. My aunt had that. My mom had that. Like, keep going. You make my life easier right now. That's and awesome. I realized I was becoming a beacon of hope. So I started doing everything on social media, like recovery and all of my uh, therapy, which tears and all, I did it all. So... It was an interesting way of life because I have such an awkward fan base now that I have veterans and I have, you know, rare disease supporters and I have <laughs> you kind of just country go across music. The so map like, yeah. Nonprofit help. Exactly. You're doing some great <laughs> yes. Texas country. Kind of all over the board. <laughs> yeah. All over like the it. board. It's so, crazy. So before we get into like what you're currently doing now, first of all, what did you do in the military? I was security forces. Oh. Chair Force represents one of those. Hey, Chair Force is good for everybody but cops because we were. Held to a higher standard. Oh, that's where you get the fancy uh, hat. Yeah. Well, you're, we actually had to do our job this is, very, you, very, very tightly. Were you patrolling true. the base or what? Do you have your own car? What's going well, on? I would do patrolling the base. I would do the flight line, but then I became desk sergeant certified and I did the alarm monitors, which okay. basically means you don't get a break. Like you don't get you don't get to take your leave because you're one of three people on the entire base that has that job. So you're like, okay, well, be careful uh, what you wish for. Yeah. Keep your head down is what I was told in the beginning. And I don't do that well, if, no. as, well as well as you know. So, so uh, here's all your yeah. responsibility. Enjoy. Right? It's yeah. like, yeah, okay, well. I mean, how did you get into that? that? Like, why, why was that your passion in the military? Or did you just fall into it? Well, so my aunt right now, <laughs> was, well, she's the chief judiciary of the entire Air Force. And then she just got Lackland Air Force Base as her base. So she gets there at the end of this month. Awesome. And she is a... She's a master at anything she does. And I saw her at 11 years old, put on her blues. She just stood taller, knew who she was, and I wanted that. So mm. she became my mentor from day one. And her only advice to me was not to become a cop. So, Oops. so of course Sorry, you naturally Julie. went to do that. <laughs> no, it was actually an accident because I love guns. And I said that stupidly at, uh, uh, yeah. during my basic training before I got to pick my job. And because I was one of those kids wait, that Wait, wait, wait. How did lied? that conversation pop up? I like guns to the drill sergeant. No, 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 no. It's you do these surveys and they're like, you know, different things you're interested in. And I was told if you say you do not like weapons, they will kick you out. It's like, if you can't hold a weapon, guess what? You can't play in the military. It's not a thing. So I was like, but I loved it. And I was so fast at like taking the guns apart and putting it back together. Like I just, anything I do, I pretty much do the best of my ability, like pretty extreme. You don't have acid. 
Yeah. Not at all. Whole ass it. So I like whole I would ass. finish it and everybody else would finish like after me and I'd be like waiting. So that that made him go, you'd be a really great cop. And I'd be like, oh, I cried so hard. Oh, no. I was so scared my, my aunt was going to be upset with me. I was like, that's not what I want to do. Like, the only reaction? advice. She, I don't remember if she actually had one. She's just proud of me for going to the Air Force in the first place. It was the only one in my generation between all of her kids, between my aunt's kids, between my mom's kids, everybody. My whole family before me was military. My grandparents, mm. my, mom, my, my dad, my aunt, all of them, all my uncles, and I'm the only one in my generation to go military. Really? Wow. So, so how did that feel the first time you deployed? Well, when I deployed, my son was five months old. Oof. And he was still on oxygen That's because be he was premature. Wow. And you were just trying to kick him out so that you could... Of course, of course. Get out of my body! <laughs> Get well, out! It was, it was definitely um, a trying situation. Yeah, I, can I got told at four months uh, postpartum because I did my PT test. My best friend and I were pregnant together in the military. And then uh, when she got, when she got, after she had her kid, hmm. she was on the bigger program because she didn't pass her PT test. Uh, and I was gung ho. I was terrified to be that person. So I busted my butt in four months to the day, which is the day you actually, the first day you're allowed to test again. And they made me test again, like immediately. I was like, really? Oh, really? Like, thanks, guys. And I did it, and I got a 98. And they were like, oh, great. You just made yourself deployable. <laughs> yeah, I was you're like, worldwide qualified. Uh, oh, wait. Perfect. That's a, <laughs> worldwide that's a shot qualified. in the foot. So, I, uh, yeah, they were like, well, it's one of those things. They didn't say this per se, but the Air Force didn't issue your family. So, yeah, I was the most senior senior uh, enlisted on base without any deployment underneath my belt. So, I had to go. Yep. And kind of got to earn your way, right? Oh, and yeah. this was yeah. in what year? This was in 08, no, 09. Well, okay. I got told 09. I was deploying in 08, at okay. the end of 08. And then I deployed in February of 09. Well, I had to do a training program first for TSC, tactical security elements, guarding OSI outside the wire. Mm. And we had, uh, I think, 27 people on our team, on our squad. And then the day we got home from training, which we were supposed to have like two or three months in between, and then we were going to deploy after our training. Lies. Uh, we were told, right? <laughs> we were told our whole mission was scrubbed except for 13 people. And, uh, and I you. was one of the 13. You, of, yeah. course. of course. And I'm like, one of the 13. I'm like, yeah. really? Like, and I had a six day turnaround. Oof, so my mom had quick. to collect all my kids' stuff. We had to figure all this out in six days. I had to do all my get out, you know, deployment paperwork yeah. and all my. Pre-deployment spin yeah. up and everything. You know, I brain dumped yeah. a lot of the acronyms and a lot of the things we used to say. I mean, you got to make room for all those lyrics that you got going on in your head, probably. Oh, actually. So that was, <laughs> yeah. when I was sitting on the flight line in um, Kandahar, I was sitting, well, it wasn't even the flight line. It was really out, right outside. It was right where they started to taxi in. And mm -hmm. you're like, there's like outside and there's inside. You're like, yeah, kind of like wishy-washy there. Area right there. Yeah. So I'm waiting and I'm sitting there and I'm like, they chose to deploy me. Like, really? So I started writing a song about my pregnancy and how upside down it was in the first place. Mm. And at the very end, it says, and now she stares at the airplanes to dust. She glances at pictures, can't wait to hear him fuss. She writes a lot to fill a void. And if you were wondering, this girl got deployed. Mm. And that was just a poem. And I still, I can't write and actually sing something if it's still current. If it's still happening to me, I can write about trauma after I've started to heal. After you've probably And I realized that later because I don't write a song to heal myself. I write to heal other people mm. yeah. through the power of music. And I can't seem to write that yet. I can't seem to get it into music form just yet. Haven't quite processed it yet or I don't it's know. Just not... I don't know if I ever will. That's yeah. actually a form of PTSD. It's called it maternal PTSD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's the most unnatural thing in the world. I missed my kids' first steps, first teeth, first words. Yep. But I did the first day that uh, my son said, Mama, there was the command, the base commander, which was an amazing human being, is a Marine. And I broke all kinds of rules, I'm sure, on this day. <laughs> I'm at the gate and we're, we're doing everything and I just can't keep a smile off my face. And he's like, you know, Senior Emma Wheeler, can I, can, I, can I figure out what that smile is about? And I was like, my son said mama today. <laughs> and I just like <laughs> broke down and he's just, he's actually still been a good friend of mine ever since. So. That's yeah. awesome. So you've been writing music your whole career. I've been writing music my whole life. Mm. Um, I started singing at like five years old at a block party um, for 4th of July. I sing Winona Judd. <laughs> I used to call it, I later read Rose, but it's called I Saw the Light. 
And uh, I sang that at five years old and everyone's like, what and just happened with that voice and this? My sister's so funny. She's now like one of my biggest supporters, but she used to tell me, sing with your real voice. Like, it's no, it's not funny. Like sing with your real voice. <laughs> Like were growing using, up. Were you using some sort of like singing voice or like were you? I just always have. It? I've oh, okay. used my vocal cords. I don't know yeah. how to explain it. Did you ever go through a phase where you just like, you know, cracked, cracked voice and you, as you're growing up and had issues with singing or no, just that's always a male natural? thing, dear. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm Women's not familiar voice don't with the crack female with hormones. Form. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no, I didn't. Uh, I never had to deal with any of that, but. I've had to train it because when mm. I first got in the mili- military, good Lord, when I first got in the music industry and it was these this really long shows and so much strain on my voice, I wouldn't be able to talk for like three days. Mm. So that's when I started getting lessons to figure out how to prolong my yeah. gift instead of ruining it like five shows into my career. Yeah. So I used to be able to do like one three hour show and then yeah, especially after touring back to back, I imagine, oh. right? If you're doing multiple shows oh, at a time. Oh, yeah. It was rough. And then you have to realize what to drink and what to spray and what to make sure you you're don't You're supposed to drink eat. milk right before you oh, get God, on, no. on no stage, dairy, right? No dairy, no mouth, dairy, no mouth, dairy. Mouth, 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 a lot of milk. A lot of milk. Coffee. No. <laughs> Coffee. Actually, that's pretty bad <laughs> for you, too, it? right? <laughs> Come on. Actually, whiskey is a pretty good before show shot, let me tell you. I mean, it loosens you up, right? It does. Yeah. It does. Yeah, I mean. Um, but no, when I was, I was going pretty hard when I first started the music industry because it was like, Okay, so my job is to literally sell liquor. When you're playing bars, that's actually your job. Venues are different. Oh. But when you're playing bars, you're teaching people to go like, hey, grab your drink, let's go. Buy some more liquor. Raise Watch me drink it. Oh, buy me a shot. I'm like, I have to drink these. <laughs> ah! So I had to learn my way around that world. It was, it was, it was, it was strange. Yeah, so, so you would say that a lot of your, your lyrics derive from the experiences that you faced in your life. All of them do, actually. Mm, yeah. I write... All of my own. I go from personal experience, past experience. When I first started writing, you know, in a professional capacity, it was all about leaving an abusive marine that mm-hmm. started self medicating. Mm-hmm. And it was pain on paper. That's what I call it. I need to write a song called Pain on Paper because it's what I say all the time. But whenever you can put all that passion and all that pain on paper and be able to sing it with emotion and Conviction. Yeah. My one job in the music industry is to invoke emotion. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when you learn to do that, it's an incredible feeling. It's very powerful. And Mm. it's only way you can do it is if you're passionate with what you do. You have to be. So you use the writing aspect as, or do you use the writing aspect as more of the therapy portion of it to help you process and figure out how you're feeling about it? From the lyrics in your songs, that's kind of what it seems like is you use it as a therapeutic avenue. That's what I originally thought. And I know that is an entity of it, but that's what I mean by, by the time I am able to write about it, I've already started the healing process. Mm, So it's more, I heal when I help others heal. That's, I think, where I go. It's, if I can write a song about something I went through and show you you're not alone and show you that we're all going through this and that there's light at the end of the tunnel, that's therapy for me. That's, yeah. That's when I can help and coach people through stuff and With, trauma. You know, yeah. therapy through mentorship is a, is an absolute thing as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and that that's what you're doing. You know, when you're engaging in all the nonprofit work that you do and you're going out there and you're helping other people overcome the, their adversities, you know, by doing that, you're doing it for yourself as well, right? Yes, it's, it's, it's a selfish endeavor, I promise you. <laughs> it's, it really does help though. And there's times when when I get down and then... All I do is literally go through some of the buddy checks that we see on social media and look for someone that reached out for help and I, I help them too. And then I help myself in the process. It's kind of an interesting combination. Hmm. Where, amazing. where do you find yourself having the most motivation to write? Like, what is a good, what do you do when you sit down with that pen and paper? Is there a process? Like, where is it at? What are you feeling most of the time? Sometimes there's a process. Mm. It's sometimes, I go different ways. Like random if thoughts I'm, on a plane. Right? <laughs> yeah. Actually, no, that's where I wrote Light Up to Live. Yeah, I really? wrote Light Up to Live on the way to Cabo. And it's not, was not a fun trip. One of my best friends got into a motorcycle accident and busting some vertebrae in his neck and he's still paralyzed to this day. Yeah. Um, but I was basically told like, he needs you because you've been through this. Mm. And I was like, okay. And I had just started to walk like through two months beforehand. And I'm like, okay, so I'm on this plane and I'm like, 
how does this happen, God? Like, what do I do? What do I say? How do I heal this person? Like, they're looking to me for advice because I've been there. Yeah. So I just, I just started writing the first song I ever wrote about God, wow. about asking God for help. That's and it's, amazing. Hit your knees, beg for mercy. When you're on your way to the top and you get knocked down, the, the, part, the part of it that I love is you're not alone. Mm. Yeah. That's it's powerful. Yeah. It is super powerful. So, no, go, go ahead. ahead. No. Go can ahead. You, can you touch a little bit on that? Uh, I mean, you went through being paralyzed as well. You just kind of touched that's on that a little took bit. It right from my mouth. That's, that's kind of <laughs> the took it right from my mouth. That's a big thing you kind of just glossed <laughs> over. Yes. So, on Mother's Day of 2018, um, I, was, I woke up and within about six hours, I was paralyzed from my neck down and I was on life support. And it was the day that I released a song for my mother about her sacrifice in my life because she, again, watched my child as I was deployed. And yeah. every time I've needed her, she's dropped everything at the, you know, just to help. And she had two jobs working as a kid. She got me through cheerleading, all of that, just mm. through her own means. And she was a single parent and just busted her butt for us. And I wrote a song to that effect. And the day that I released it, I became paralyzed. It was on Mother's Day. So, so walk us through that process real quick. I mean... How, how did you how did you just go paralyzed? What happened? Yeah. Did you realize something okay, was so wrong? Or? The Friday before, so I, I just I got sung a really up. good song and it was so dope. I just went numb. Right, you're like, <laughs> and we're done. That's it, and we're done. Yeah. So <laughs> the Friday, so I had just gotten asked to go on tour with another musician mm -hmm. from uh, All Star Entertainment. So I was going to go to all of Texas, Louisiana, um, New Mexico, and. Mm, I can't remember Florida or something. Okay, but a little Southwest tour. It was a yeah, it was a it was a multi-state tour, and I was super excited. And it was going to start in July, but I was going to go meet the band that I was going to play with. So I went there Friday in Round Rock, and met them. Round Rock, Colorado. No, Round Rock, Austin. <laughs> There's like, Round Rock everywhere. By I know, the way. I know. Tell Round us Rock a is bit everywhere. More. <laughs> Round Rocks, guys, they're a thing. Yeah. Some of them are sharp though. <laughs> no, so. I'm, I'm there and I'm like, God, my foot hurts so bad. I don't know what's going on. Like I, I was wearing heels, so I thought I twisted it or something. Mm. And I actually didn't remember this until I started going back through text messages well after I was paralyzed. And I tossed my guitarist. I was like, hey, can I have like a heating pad or something? Because my foot's dying. Like I'm, so I went over there and like iced and heated my foot for a while, mm -hmm. not knowing what was going on and not putting two and two together even after. So Saturday comes around and then I had to go to uh, Houston. Mm -hmm. And I was meeting with a venue out there to do some nonprofit show. And I go out there and I'm like sitting down at this meeting and it feels like there's fire ants biting me behind my knee. And I'm like, eh, okay, so guys, I'm sorry. I really have to cut this short. I have to go. Yeah, like I'm in a lot of pain right now. Something's wrong. Yeah. And I was, I was beating the hell out of myself playing like eight shows a month. I mean, eight shows a week. Trust me. Like it's a thing. I did two a day sometimes. Damn. Just yeah. running myself through the ground. So I thought, you just overdid it, Deanna. You need to stop. So... I get about halfway home and my leg basically goes numb to my, to my hip. I get out of my car and like slide myself into my house. And oh, I had shit. a babysitter at the time. And I was like, I'm just going to go to bed. And he was like, no, you're not. Like, it's not a thing. Like, yeah. you can't do that. You have to go to the hospital. And, and I'm very, very just weird about hospitals. Sleep it off at that yeah, right? point. I mean, just no. shake it off. You know? I, was, I, I even called the hospital. <laughs> like, if you're going to give it. me a yeah. Valium and pat me on the butt and tell me, you know, take it easy, it's not going to work. I'm not yeah. going to go. Yeah. And I have a weird thing about that. Anytime I walk into a hospital, it seems to keep me. Mm. Go figure. But <laughs> so I go there. Well, they, they tell me, they're like, this is a medical emergency. If you don't want to come, we'll pick you up. Oh, like, shit. This is like, legit. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I got there. It was Mother's Day Eve. Do you know what mothers do on Mother's Day Eve? Uh, nothing. There's a lot of hypochondriacs <laughs> in the world, and they uh, want to see their kids. And sometimes the only they way the is hospital. through emergency. Yeah. It uh. is packed to the gills. And I'm like, I'm going to be here for 18 hours before I even see anybody. Four minutes, four minutes was I in the, in the waiting room until they gave me not only everyone sitting in the hallways in these, in these emergency rooms and I have my own room. Ooh, it's a little yeah. worry. You're like, mm, yeah, like, I don't okay. think I like this very much. <laughs> this is something so serious it's, is going It's in on. your head already. You're building, building oh, yeah. this up in your oh, head. Yeah. So here I am. I'm sitting in this bed and this, this screen turns around and it's a person. I'm like, oh, that's weird. So he's like, we think we know what's going on with you. We're going to do some MRIs. We're going to call on our team that was off. And I'm like, that sucks. Happy Mother's Day. So they yeah. call on this team and turns out I had Guillain-Barre. I woke up to, um, well, the first time I woke up was pretty embarrassing. But hey, it's a podcast. I get to say it. <laughs> so I wake up. Give me the details. I want the details right now. You pee yourself, up. right? I'm just kidding. It's so worse. It's worse. But it's on the same lines. It's horrible. <laughs> you know, 
Definitely prepare, TMI coming up. Prepare yourself. So <laughs> I wake up and I basically have like my face pushed up against like a like the 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 table. And my ass is up in the air. <laughs> and I'm like, what? What's going on? He goes, well, you had a pretty good bowel movement. I'm like, oh my God. Uh, I could have gone my whole life without knowing that. But then I you. found out I had this IVIG stuff in my arm and they were like, well, you have an autoimmune disorder called Guillain-Barre. Mm. And, you know, this is not a cure, but it's going to push out the ugly antibodies that are trying to kill you. I don't know if I said that word, word right. Antibodies? antibodies? Did I say antibodies? Antibodies. And antibiotics, antibodies. antibodies in one word? Your country, it's okay. Right, yeah. I can make words. <laughs> antibodies? A- antibiotics? <laughs> antibiotics? I don't know. But Little I, learned, I learned everything I know from Osmosis Jones. So. <laughs> <laughs> Osmosis. Yeah, there it is. It's, it's okay, David. <laughs> but so I have this IVIG and they say, you know, because my it's my central nervous system that attacked my peripheral nerves yes, and yeah. took away all feeling, all sensation, all muscle memory, which I had to get all of it back, including learning how to speak, which means learning how to sing. So it was from the neck? It was down. from the neck down. Damn. Oh my God. Yeah. How long did this last? It from was- the neck down. So it would have probably lasted less, but they gave me IVIG hmm. and I became highly allergic to it within four days. Oh, wonderful. Ooh, well, that's fantastic. I-, I mean, first of all, you know, if your face is against the, the table who scooped you up and put you in the chair. I want to know that. I don't know. I don't know. Doctors, nurses, teams. I, I close my eyes. Yeah. Oh, I <laughs> honestly, like they gave me so much medication. Point. I was very, very fluttery. Like I opened my eyes and then I'd be somewhere else. Like, oh, okay. I went to sleep. What are your initial thoughts when you're sitting there? I mean, honestly, I thought, um, cause I have slip discs from the military injuries mm-hmm. and stuff. And it's, I just thought it severed my spinal cord. I was done. I had no idea. There was nothing more scary in my whole life. It was my biggest fear on the planet to be paralyzed. Yeah. Because I grew up in the, you know, Christopher Reeves era. Yeah. And it sucks. Watching watch like, him just be was, trapped. And I saw these lifetime movies of these people paralyzed and they had everything and they were sports stars and then they were paralyzed and then they wanted to be, you know, dead for yeah. lack of a better word. So I'm like, I don't, I don't want that. Yeah. And yeah. I guess be careful what you don't wish for. <laughs> Did you know, with Black Rifle Coffee's Coffee Club subscription, you can get fresh coffee shipped to you every month? What? You don't even have to go to the store. Whoa. You don't even have to leave your bed. What? Wow. How did you get in here? You might want to go ahead and join the Black Rifle Coffee Club subscription before one of these guys shows up at your place. Or appreciate what you have, I guess, exactly. right? Appreciate what so, you have. So you you get home and you're you get home from the hospital and you're still paralyzed at that point. You get home from the hospital six months later. Six months later. So that was the longest Mother's Day of your life. Damn. But what wasn't fair was I wasn't allowed to see my kids for two weeks. Really? So well, well, why, because why I was, is that? I was in ICU. Oh, okay. And that you can't have anybody in there. But I did wake up. 10 hours after I got there to my mother's face from California. She flew, she quit her job. She flew to rescue my kids from whatever babysitters they were going to be with. Your Because I was a single mom for a long time. She is a superhero. Yeah. And I wrote the song, The Woman You Made, just for her. And I finally got to do the video last year. Last year? Yeah, last year for her. That's awesome. What's your favorite line of that song? You sacrificed so much for us. You did everything you could. Mm, Yeah. But it's actually, so you're my mother forever. Now I have no fear. You made me want to rock the boat. And now I only steer. Ah, okay. So, I like that. That's great. I mean, having a support system like that around you. I mean, you had a great aunt, a great mother. Yeah, that's pretty invaluable. Yeah. It's, yeah. I couldn't have done it without any of them. Any of them. It's been... So, six months. What did they do to remedy that situation while you're, you're there? Is it just... I mean, there's got to be physical therapy. Things. There's got to be atrophy that sets in after. Oh, like my legs are about that big around. It was horrific. Oh. I was like grossed out, even though I've always wanted to be skinny my whole life. I'm like, not that skinny. Really? <laughs> not, no. not this type of Don't skinny. Take my, my, cause I had, I was so proud of my strong legs and my calves my whole life. And they're like, I'm like, okay. Yeah. I had Where to rebuild everything. <laughs> but and it was baby steps to get there. I'm sure. Literally. So where'd you do your recovery and, and time in? So I was, um, where was it? Don't even St. Remember. David's, yeah, right. St. David's Rehabilitation Center for the first four months. And then 
I wasn't recovering. So they were like, well, we're not going to use all the state of the art stuff until you're ready. So they put me in a skilled nursing facility, i.e., very bad yeah. place. Basic, basic yeah. care. Mm. It so, was even worse than that. It was like, I actually got them five citations by the time I left there. With this a, place has rats. With a split <laughs> open head, they gave me someone else's medication for two weeks, a broken wheelchair that my feet dragged on the floor, what? still scars to prove it. It was just, it was bad. It was really bad. And they were Damn. like, well, we're going to give them, you know, citations on Monday. So it would be yeah, best no if you're not here when we get back. I'm like, no shit. Okay. Oh. So it so was, I, it was ugly. So how was the prognosis? Was that... Were they expecting you to get better? Or 18 were- month prognosis, 18 months to two year prognosis. And you and did, I did it, it six months. Even actually, it was only five. It was five when I actually was able to stand up again. When mm-hmm. I took the day I took my first steps, my dad died. So I think that so he went up there. You just went through a shit ton of adversity real quick. Honestly, I looked up and I was like, really? Like, yeah. You got to okay. ask yourself why. No, so yeah, stop doing that. <laughs> mm. I used to do that all the time. Like, yeah. why me? Why now? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So when I was in the hospital about two weeks in, realized I wasn't listening to any music, wasn't humming a tune, wasn't writing anything. Mm. I was just kind of dormant. Yeah. yeah. Just kind of sitting there like, well, this sucks. Well, I imagine and, your mood's pretty depressed at that point. I mean- I don't I'm- even know if depressed was the word because I had depression and anxiety my whole life. Mm -hmm. And especially after the military, I had suicidal ideation. I had it all. Yeah. The day I found music is the day, the last day I had any of those thoughts. Even like, and that's why I preached this day. Like, find your why, people. If you find your why, you find your way out. You're never alone if you find your why. If you find what you love, what you're passionate about, and you can explore that and share it with the world and bring people with you and, you know, explore different ways to heal. It's it's pretty wonderful. And it's, it's saved my life. That's truly, amazing. truly saved my life. I and I say people, it a lot. I love seeing people who use creative outlets like that. We've, uh, we've got a good friend of ours who wrote a book on uh, poetry. He used poetry to help get through some of his, uh, some of his symptoms that he was and dealing it's with. it's dark. It is dark poetry. It's dark. It's brooding. It's powerful. But it's and, powerful. And that's what he's feeling yeah. in the moment. So like he does that through lyrics as well. What's his name? Yeah. Antonio. Antonio. We might have him on here in the next couple weeks, actually. Antonio what? Uh, we're not going to say any names because we don't have permission yet. We don't have permission. <laughs> quite, yet. <laughs> quite yet. But it, I love seeing people use creative outlets like that, especially when they're doing it out of a selfless purpose. So you experience something and you want to be able to present that to other people. Hey, this is how I dealt with it. This is my emotions and this is how I processed it in kind of packaged into a song. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I think that's And it's so awesome. funny that we, we talk to so many different people about what their outlet is. And, you know, it could be anything. It, it could be writing music. It could be going to the gym. That's what I do for my therapy, you know? You don't and say, David. I know. <laughs> and it's huge. It, and everyone's like, why do you work out so hard? I do it for my brain. I do it for my mind to get my mind right so that, you know, I'm not a nightmare <laughs> to everybody I know. <laughs> I'm the same way. If I don't have my creative outlet, which is actually kind of happening right now, I'm like chomping at the bit because I'm not playing that many shows because we're... We're doing a lot of rebranding and mm. my music video is about to hit CMT Woo. for my song, Whiskey Weather. Oh, so I'm yeah. super That's excited exciting. about that. Yeah. How's that make you feel? Oh, it's elated. I'm, I'm so Surreal. grateful and it's, it's time. I'm so ready. Yes. I'm so ready. I'm not getting any younger. It's you know, well I'm not some 22 year old that has their life ahead of them. It's like, okay, it's time to hurry you up. Plenty, you got plenty to look forward to. You got to. plenty. Oh, yeah. yeah, you I'm got excited. plenty. On the precipice. The precipice of greatness, greatness. right? Greatness. Yes. There it is. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers to that. If I had, oh, whiskey is the only thing I got. <laughs> there is a oh, little bit whiskey. This stuff <laughs> is all, uh, it's fucking awesome. Isn't it, di- isn't it different? Yeah. It yeah, is. I, I don't, I don't drink pretty much at all anymore, but this, this is pretty tasty. It kind of goes, you know, screwball whiskey, right? Oh yeah. Yep. So, or is it whiskey? Yeah. It's screwball shot, the peanut butter shot. Yeah. The peanut it's butter. It's kind of guy. along the same lines. It's so different and so weird that it's, it's really good. But tasty at the same yeah. time. It's like bacon whiskey. It's like mm. people use that for like no. Bloody Marys and shit. Yeah. Like, eh, nope. I don't know if I'm into it. <laughs> like, this I can get behind though. Right. So, yeah. you know, you mentioned, and I want to kind of backtrack a little bit. You mentioned the, you know, being a mother, you know, while deployed and like how, what was your initial thoughts with that? I mean, how, how is that? So kind of goes back to my poem because it said, because so my son was a twin. And his twin passed away at a very early age in my belly. And I was on bed rest for a long time. So part of my, my I say song, but it's a poem. It's not a song yet. 
Not yet, but maybe one day. I don't know. <laughs> um, Keep that one on the back burner until right? you're ready. I don't. I, see, I still don't know how any way to to formulate it into a song. I just I just don't get it. Maybe it's just beautiful the way it is. Yeah, maybe yeah. maybe it'll just stay there. When I can remember it. Sometimes I can't remember all of it. I'm like. <laughs> Huh. We wrote it quite a while ago. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a few years. But, um, and it, it was, so I was in the hospital two, two weeks before because I had, because he wasn't, uh, he wasn't, his heart, his heart rate was going down and his, mm. the cord was dropped around his neck. He was like a dog on a leash and his cord was really low because they found out I had MTHFR, which is caused micro blood clotting in the placenta and it didn't let them eat very much. Oh. And so he was like one pound, six or one pound, 10 ounces. At birth. Wow, very premature, oh, very small. Man. He was very, very little. And he was on death's door for the first two weeks of his life. Damn. But he was very strong. And yeah. I called him my fiery little one. And little you're what? Fiery fi- little one. Fiery I named him Aiden. One. Little fighter, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and he man. was. He was he was he was awesome. That's amazing. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> TBI at its best, y'all. I don't TBI. remember. Yeah. All three of us yeah. have TBI. Yeah. Yeah. Well, welcome back. Are three, we done with the show? Three head traumas. <laughs> Where am God. I? No, no, no. I was just saying like being a mother while you're, you're deployed and, you know, going through those experiences, you know, a lot of people, you know, are like, what's the justification for being able to deploy when you have a, a child that young, you know, and, and how do you justify that for yourself? Well, you have the opportunity before I think you're five months old or five months pregnant to get out of the military. So hmm. if you choose to stay in, on your own accord. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. you choose to, to take whatever you get. Yeah. So I did that. And, you know, me and my flight chief, we all cried in the office and everything. I was just in tears, like in a ball. Like, I don't understand why they would take me away when he was still so new in my poem. Um, yeah. My family was confused too. Everybody was just like, I don't get it. Yeah. Um, But it's just, it was the way of the world. I was... I had to deploy and I needed to be there. And I was rightfully there for a reason. Yeah. yeah. And a um, lot of tears. I know you guys are familiar, but when you guys, when we're deployed, every emotion is magnified. It is. Like to the fullest extent. If you're, if you're happy, you're like super weirdly bipolar happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then if you're sad, you're like on death's door about to kill yourself kind of thing. But there was an emotion there that, that no one can really bottle up. And that's, you know, the longing of being you know, having your little baby hold your fingertip and watching him fight in the hospital for, for, for weeks before coming home and then having to leave him. Yeah. I was his glorified babysitter when I got home. He didn't recognize me. Yeah. yeah that good. had to be painful. It was. It was very painful. My mom showed him pictures every day, mama and my uniform and different pictures. And he would point to the pictures and know who I am. But in real life, he didn't. Mm. And I got home. He was 13 months old. And I'm just like, okay. We're good. And he wasn't much bigger than when I left. It was really strange. But um, I'll never forget the day he remembered me. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. one of the pictures was me holding him, my hair back, in my uniform, face to the side. It was just a really weird image. Yeah. He looked in the mirror, and I was in my uniform, and he looked up at me. He looked in the mirror. He looked up at me. And then sm- had the biggest smile on his face and buried his face in my chest. And I was just like, uh, finally, that minute, some relief. I knew he knew who See I was. See that recognition in his eyes? It was very intense. And now wow. he's like my little bud buddy. He he's, <laughs> can't be five feet away from me. I love him to death. And he's a better singer-songwriter than I am. Oh, wow. yeah? He's incredible. Oh, my God. He wrote a song about following your heart and seeing what's right in front of your face. He wrote the song that you Adam totally proposed jack to me, it from too. Him. <laughs> should totally steal it from him. Yes. Take all the credit. <laughs> no. No, even like my producers, my guitarists, everybody wants his hooks. It's really, really? funny. Yeah. But he's uh, so incredibly shy. How old he, is he now? He's 12. 12 now. He's okay. about to be 13. Oh, God help me. Oh, oh man. Teenager. Actually, I pretty much lucked out because he's a certified genius. He does the a Rubik's Cube with one hand and like 18 moves. I'm he's like, damn. better than I could do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 18 right? hours for a I, <laughs> I don't know how the genetics process all of that stuff, but it's not mine. <laughs> lucked out? <laughs> mm are you sure it's your kid? Did you get him tested? I mean, yeah. Are you sure I mean, it's your kid? I don't know if you can you can really screw up the teeny tiny little. I don't so know if they're swapped I, at birth did, at that point. How's my so, baby 10, 10 pounds? I don't really understand. Yeah, what happened? He was old enough to realize, you know, what you were struggling with then uh, when you went paralyzed. I mean, how what was his reaction? He was pretty scared, but you know what? My middle son, he's he was six years old. And this is where my TBI hit because I was gonna say this and I forgot where I was going. 
So I was in the hospital, didn't listen to music, didn't do anything. My son, I call him a little star child to this day. Hmm. He is, he's just, he's very connected and very spiritual and wants to help homeless people. It's adorable. You should have him on your show. But, um, <laughs> Tune down. Next, and Tune he's got week. so Tune in much charisma, week. it's unreal. So he was six years old and I'm keto at the time. I don't need a, a cookie, a cake, a chip. I won't even lick a potato I, I chip. I haven't had a carb like, since 2006. Since 2001. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it was just like, I was so against it. Once you detox off a of sugar, you're like, mm, yeah, get away. No, thank yeah. you. So my mom's like, oh, here's a fortune cookie. I'm like, no, I'm good. And she's like, for God's sakes, eat the fortune cookie. Your son was freaking out that this is mommy's fortune cookie. And I'm like, okay, okay. At this point, like I said, my motivation was shot. Nothing was happening inside my head. I was just like, why me kind of thing. Mm. And I get this fortune cookie from my son sitting on my lap. And it says, the world will soon be ready for your many talents. Hmm. Did Talk you put, about- Did you yeah. put the Powerball numbers in too? Or what? Right? <laughs> oh my God, you have no idea. I still have it to this day. And, but, and if, the, if the Powerball doesn't get you a millionaire, then you can't. Can't trust right? the words, No right? validity there. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, dude, you missed. You no, missed but it. Um, it brought me back to reality real quick. Yeah. And I realized then, because I had, I had canceled shows, I had canceled a podcast and a radio show. And I called the radio host and I'm like, hey, it was from Wimberley, Wimberley Valley Radio, which was coach. And uh, called him and I said, hey, I can't do your show, but um, I'm going to actually tell you why instead of just being all secretive and mysterious, because I was just trying to hide and I was going to like duck out without anybody Oh, poor, poor, pitiful you kind yeah, of thing. kind of hard to explain that sometimes. Yeah, it was very hard. Yeah. So we decided that he was going to do the radio show from my, my hotel room. Really? My hotel room. My hospital room. Your hospital That's room. That's how I got through that, by the way. I called it my hotel room for a long time. <laughs> I mean, six months. Yeah. It is kind of a hotel at six that point. Six months, it is a hotel. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that yeah. one was actually four, but it was just like, mm, it was not a good place to be. But at least I had my own room. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty nice. So kind of look on the bright side. <laughs> no, seriously. It was very nice. So much state-of-the-art equipment, everything. It was great. And you there. got your own room. So, I mean. I did. I didn't have to nice. share Special treatment, maybe. <laughs> no, I don't know about that. <laughs> but it was a great place to be. There was great people. They were so talented and everything. But I started to recover over Facebook Live and different things because I finally stopped hiding and realized that healing in public was what I needed to do. Mm. Some people are hiders. I'm not. I have to be with people. I have to, I have to communicate. I yeah. have to speak. Extrovert. I have to have that contact. And I had yeah. nothing. Yeah. But I had, I mean, once I got on social media, I had 90 visitors a day. And I had these pink boards, a pink, what are they called? P poster boards. Yeah. With everybody that signed it and like, they bedazzled them. And I That's still have them to this day. And it just has all these inspiring quotes and messages and keep going and all their signatures. And it just showed me so much love. Yeah. They did. Um, at least two or three benefits for my for my recovery and everything else because I almost lost my house in the process. I ended up actually losing my house in the process, but wow. it was, they did everything to raise money to keep it. And they did. They actually, we raised enough money to keep my house. It was a little bit different because they actually put me in foreclosure for not paying taxes, which I didn't owe. So that was a fun ball game. <laughs> oh, geez. Oh yeah. Trust me. It was not a fun situation. Yeah. But, we'll get their money. <laughs> they They made... You know, in Round Rock, they had three venues. They had Round Rock Tavern, uh, Rocky's Piano Bar, and Long Branch Saloon. They all did benefits, and they raised thousands and thousands and tens and thousands of dollars to save my my future, you know, to save my life yeah. and save my kids. Because, I mean, people don't realize when you go in the hospital, guess what? Everything is like triple. Yeah. Triple child care. You don't cook anymore for your kids, so you don't know where they're getting food. You have to give them. Yeah. You have to give them everything you have. Yeah. And I didn't have show money anymore. It was all crazy. That kind of support is, I mean, that, that speaks volumes to the type of person that you are. I mean, obviously. two bands played for free. Wow. Wow. You know how hard that is? That's a, that's a that's lot, lot of coordination. That's a ton just of to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so Robert Wagner, he's in Austin. He's the lead singer of Suede. He like spearheaded it all. And he was on Fox 7 News all the time talking mm. about it. And he brought all these bands together and they just... They all supported me and it was it was an incredible feeling. And all of the nonprofits, because I just learned about nonprofits and doing shows for them. And yeah. Yeah. it's like my name on the marquee, not like being vain, but any name on the marquee makes money for a cause. Started yeah. with Hurricane Harvey. Once I realized they could do that, I started reaching out to all these nonprofits, like, hey, I'll do a show for you guys. Like, I want to help, blah, blah, blah. I'm a veteran, blah, blah, blah. And then I worked with one of them that's uh, Wheelers for the Wounded, and I made a play like, 
<laughs> wheelers for wheeler. <laughs> and then all of these nonprofits were the ones to come to my aid. Mm, yeah. They had bridging the gap between 30 Jeeps up outside and they did all these like crazy tours and stuff. It was crazy. It was a beautiful situation. And all of these people came to my aid. That's amazing. So, so then, would you attribute that to pulling you out of the darkness then? I mean, is that? Oh, 100%. So you're in your head, you know, obviously stuck in your own head at this point. Literally. <laughs> yeah. Literally stuck. Literally. Can't, prisoned in your body. Can't wiggle yeah. your toesies, if you will. <laughs> yeah. So and they were stabbing me with things every day. It's fun. <laughs> So, I mean, you had all these, this support system coming at you from every different angle. Is, and that was what helped your mental health? It really did. It mm-hmm. did. Whenever anything, I think with me, if I know I'm helping someone, I get better. For some yeah. reason, I get better whatever I'm doing. If I'm, if I'm mentoring, like we talked about, then somehow I become superhuman and I just get stronger. Yeah, of course. And because all eyes are on you at that point, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, and then people would tell me like, oh, nobody would fight like that. I'm like, Everybody would fight like that. That is so mm-hmm. true. Yeah. And 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 how many times did you hear like uh, I would never be able to deal with? That. I know. And I'm like, and, and it bothered me after a while. Yeah. I'm like, you know what? All these people saying they wouldn't be able to do it. You weren't there. <laughs> One of them. You would that, always yeah. do it. You can't. So what are you going to do? Just sit there? You'll never be able to experience that situation until you're in that experience. Yeah. And then it's day to day. It's hour by hour, minute by minute, whatever it takes to get to the next step. Yeah, pretty much. I wrote a song called "Who I Am" because one of this. One of the big things about when I was paralyzed was I don't want to be forgotten. I don't want to be the sick girl. I don't, I want to have a legacy. Mm, so yeah. I wrote a song called Who I Am, and I hope it inspires people to this day, you know, to want to be something bigger and better than what they are. And if they are bigger and better than what they are, what they were, then stay that way mm-hmm. and keep thriving forward. Cause if you're not progressing, you're regressing. And yeah. I just don't, I don't like it. And I don't work well if I'm not moving forward and having a trajectory. That's like, even during COVID, I was like, yeah, stagn- well, also, what do I do with my hands? also, you're sitting there in the chair and you're questioning what you brought up earlier, your why. You're questioning your, your why at that point, because now it's in a different world. You're in a oh, different yeah. world where you don't know which direction you're going. So, I mean, you, you must have been crushed from that. I wasn't. Doesn't because seem like after, it. Yeah. after I mean, that fortune most cookies. People, my point being was that would break most people. Most would be. people. Yeah. After that fortune cookie, I was broken before that fortune cookie. <laughs> the fortune cookie saved the your fortune life. The fortune cookie told me that this was God's plan. And that's when you gave up yeah. keto. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I was keto until I went to the nursing the home. The is... nursing home from hell that covered everything in gravy. <laughs> Delicious. No. Yeah, I wasn't keto after that. I even tried, you know, I went bankrupt going to like Grubhub or Uber Eats. I'm like, $75 for a salad. You're welcome. No, thank you. Thank you. With, so, with no dressing or oh God. <laughs> nothing on it. Basalmic vinegar. We're good. Yeah. But no, so. <sighs> You've got a fighter spirit. <laughs> you, you, get it. You, re- did not, yeah. you did not Putting give back up. On that's, path. that's where we're headed. Yes. Yeah. yeah you, didn't, you didn't give up. So, so what are you doing now that's helping people get through their adversity? Well, so I you don't do really a lot know. of work with nonprofits. You know, I know you're floating around. You donate a lot of your time to, to walk us through a little bit about that. Well, I've been just trying to be active in the social media se- or the nonprofit sector, and I and I make sure that you know everybody knows that I'm willing to help whatever cause it is. And but I started working with the CDFI, which is Community Development Financial Institution. Okay. It's for um, low income areas to get housing, to get grocery stores, which you're, I, I live in Dallas now, mm. but from Oak Cliff to Fair Park is a crescent moon. It's never had a grocery store, a bank, anything. So wow. even these poverty stricken people, yeah, they don't have cars, but it's also not safe to walk to the grocery store. Yeah. So imagine if the only food you could get was from the gas station on the corner for your children and they're all prepackaged crap, Just which no means nutritional their brain value. won't work, their bodies yeah. won't work. You won't super feel proud of yourself after that. And that's how you guys get stuck yep. in these in these ruts and yep. they never get better and you never get out of mm-hmm. them. So we're going to try to make them homeowners. We're going to put them through financial processes and programs. Mm. We're getting them um, certified in business, whatever they want to do, giving them grants to make their own companies. Yes. And it's, it's incredible to be a part of it. I'm one of the event coordinators for it. Uh, Michael Yorba, we found each other... So I'm going to go ADD and, or TBI, whatever you want to call it. On this Off show. on a rant and Shout a tangent. Yes. We're going to have to so, rein you in. 
when I when when COVID started, I was trying to figure out what to do with my life because music was stopped, and I didn't. I don't, you know, personally play instruments on my own to be able to do a show on TV with you. Yeah. Without like paying my guitarist and figuring this out and getting all the. Huh. It's not like I can just go home and be like, hi guys, I'm going to sing for you guys tonight. Yeah. It's just yeah. not a thing. So I had to figure out other ways of my time to do something. So uh, I did a podcast or two with um, some other people. And then I kept being asked to like co-host these podcasts because I'm fun, I guess. And I'm informative and I know how to speak, which is something I actually learned during COVID that I'm good at. I yeah. like it. And it's a different avenue because I used to go on stage and I'd sing my song and I'd have to talk in the middle and be like, okay, back to my song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it was super singing. uncomfortable at that point. And that's part. the best like, part of a concert, right? When you have the engagement from the artist, in my opinion, at least. And honestly, COVID made me a better artist because I can engage better. Yeah. So yeah. I got asked to co-host a podcast and I got to interview some of my superstars growing up, Jamie O'Neill and Sarah Evans and Randy, uh, Randy Travis and Mary Travis. Oh, wow. That- he actually spoke to me. It was amazing. Wow. It was just an incredible situation. So I learned a little bit more about myself and what I'm capable yeah. of. And then I started, I went to, I did this show, which is a stream show. And they were like, hey, would you like to host? I'm like, absolutely. So I'd go <laughs> Hell yeah. from Austin to Dallas every weekend on Saturdays. And, you know, it was called Agents of Vibe. And I would just engage with the audience. And they were like, wow, that's amazing. They got picked up by Dallas Music Network. So I actually moved to Dallas from it. And it was, it was crazy. It was, it was interesting. I got to bring musicians into the light during COVID yeah. with this huge production studio. It was beautiful what they did. And it was amazing to be a part of it. But I learned so much about what I'm capable of doing. Mm-hmm. And I love it now. It's, it's the same feeling I got when I first started going on stage. I'm like, something comes over you when, you, you, when you're in the light you're supposed to be in. Mm-hmm. And when you're doing something you love and then you find a new passion and it's like, I can do this. You feel at home. You yes. feel comfortable there. It's like, this is, this is my spot. There's nothing, I mean, nothing is more important to me than being on the stage. It's where I belong. It's where I shine. It's where I blossomed. It's where I grew as a mm-hmm. human being. Yeah. And now anything that happens negative, I'm like, where's the positive? Where's the blessing? Where is it? You gotta look gotta for find the silver it. lining, right? Yeah, yeah. How long, it's always there. How long did that take you? What, about what age? I don't want to dime damn out some ages or anything, but how long did it take you to find that comfortable point in your life? It was, it was during paralysis. Okay. I, that's, the light came to me then hmm. because I stopped saying, I don't understand. This is not fair. Why me? It was like, what are we going to use this for? Yeah. Who so, are we going to help during this process? Yeah, so to people still looking for that outlet or looking for that area of comfort or somewhere that you feel like you belong, especially post-service. I mean, most of us go through that post-service. We're kind of lost and floating around, but just keep putting in the effort, keep showing up and keep searching for what you're looking for, basically, right? Absolutely. Well, you'll find your place eventually. And it's, once you do, you'll know. Yeah. Your heart will tell you, your eyes will tell you, your your brain, your body, your skin, everything will tell you when you're in the right place with the right people and the right time. And God is interesting like that, so. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you gotta be comfortable with what you're doing and you gotta be excited about it. So what are, what are some of the like interactions that you get from your fans? Like, are they coming up to you and what's the first thing they say? It's like great music or like, I've heard your story. What, what are they saying? A lot of it's about my story nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, now it's kind of, bundled up in the same in the same package. They kind of understand it now. I do kind of have a presence in that respect. But a lot of it has always been like, man, I followed you. I'm so glad you're walking now. Last time I saw you, you were in a wheelchair. And I'm like, I was really drugged up, so I don't know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm was, dead that happened a lot, really trust high. me. But, yeah, I bet. but all these people that that always communicated with me on social media felt very close to me and they became very close to me. And to this day, like... And you're interactive. You interact with your fans. Always. And, that, and that's, that. I think that speaks volumes all in its... Self yeah. and that I was I was actually coached not to really because they were like oh you want to be less let's reach less reachable less accessible oh, more exclusive. you become you more become more exclusive. wanted and I'm like but I like people yeah I like the people who want to know me yeah. you like the impact as well I do. you want to change lives not just through music by personal experiences you've been through several so you absolutely want to I'm an share artist. that with the world I am but I'm also trying to be even more well rounded in that respect. I'm writing books. <laughs> yeah, I said plural books, books. more than one. Um, well, I'm writing my Is story. Is it a pop-up book okay. or what? Like Deanna Wheeler just pops oh up right God, in your face? Oh my God, if or only. <laughs> I, need, I need pictures. We need mine. to figure that out. That would be amazing. <laughs> if it doesn't have pictures, I won't read yeah. it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and a full coloring section. A full coloring <laughs> yes. section would be nice. Oh, for PTSD. 
Yeah. On the one side, you know how they color for, for therapy? Yeah, yeah, for the We should do like a whole art, one that's like, hey, by the way. therapy section. I'll yeah. pop up here and be like, so if you're if you're struggling today, I'll help you. <laughs> color this. Okay. And this, okay. In, interactive Recite art this. therapy book. Oh, that's a good idea. That'll Billion be dollar plan. That's a good idea. Next I want you to leave your country policy. career to pursue this new book. Well, here's the cool thing. I don't have to leave any career to pursue anything else. I can yeah. still do it. Like they've asked me, I've been asked to be, you know, a big supporting actor in a in a, in a movie that's going to be in theaters and stuff like that. Ooh. And it's it's a huge honor. Mission Impossible 16, where you're the villain? 72, yeah. actually. Fast and Furious um, 30. Yes. Fast and <laughs> Furious yeah. 35. Yeah, the but slow. I think I'm taller than Tom Cruise. I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> uh, Sorry, Dom. They'll still, they'll still angle it in a way where they're going to Oh my gosh, I know. Isn't that weird? Out. He'll stand on a box or something. <laughs> it's, it's like knees up all the I've time. I've heard some weird stuff. I, I hosted, um, what was it? American Icon Awards when they were giving Al Pacino his American Icon Award. Okay. And I was hosting and doing all the like, interviews and stuff like that. And I see Robert De Niro. Cruising on by? Is he hella short or what? <laughs> Why do I not feel threatened anymore? <laughs> I do not feel nervous anymore about meeting stars. They're little. They're all small. So, so oh, I'm going to go super ADD real quick. That did not, I was, I was super not comfortable with meeting stars and people that I know a few years ago because I was doing, um, I was in the movie, um... The Lost Husband. I was the band. Okay. Super cool role. Three second role. But, <laughs> just um, a little cameo. Right? No, I was in the band, but then, uh, <laughs> uh, what's his name? Josh. Oh I my gosh. Wouldn't I know. Josh. Uh, Josh Dumel. Dumel. Oh, Dumel. So, uh, ladies out there, if you were in Sexy. love with Josh Dumel because of Vegas, it's insane. He was gorgeous. <laughs> I was so smitten. My whole <laughs> life from like 13 on, I was in love with He's this a man. Sexy man. Yeah. Why not? And he's in this movie. And I just like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So I'm out back and we're breaking or whatever. And all of a sudden, Josh Jamel's walking up and he's like, hey, you know, I was at, like, he was looking for me. Like, Where's the singer? Blah, blah, blah. Comes up, he's like, hey, I'm Josh. I'm like, <laughs> I know who you are. <laughs> and he goes, okay. <laughs> walks away. My guitarist walks up. He's like, what was that? Like, what is wrong with you? I was like, oh. Like, what just happened? I have no idea. That just, yeah. Nothing happened. Starstruck. And he goes, you, you of all people said nothing. Josh Jamel asked for you and then you said nothing. I'm like, I do not know how to explain this. Nothing whatsoever. You, you know, you're being more exclusive as your manager said. Of so course. Not trying to be available for right? you. Yeah, like, you know. I don't yeah, speak to people. Brakes, Josh Jamel. Do not yeah. speak hey, to hey, strangers. Hey, hey. Yeah, I'm yeah. a lady. Yeah, like, you cannot can... speak to strangers. Stranger yeah. danger. <laughs> but, so I'm in there. So, and then the next break, we got, well, he was, he was in the middle. Nope, wrong. So I went to the bathroom. I, there was like, so it was at uh, Kevin Fowler's property. So he has a dance hall here, a little Airbnb looking thing, bathroom and another Airbnb looking thing. Okay. So I'm walking to the bathroom and there's this field, just nothing there. Only other person in existence is Josh Jamel walking right next to me. <laughs> I'm like, okay, great. What do I do? Trip on a pile of poles. Yeah. To the floor. He helps Smooth. me up. We're laughing. Ha ha ha. I could have made that awesome, but instead I said a vulgarity and went and went to the bathroom. I screamed the word, the F word. I said, mm. I'm not going to say it, but I was just like, and I walked to the bathroom and I was like, what is wrong with you? Again. Again. I messed this up again. No redemption need. Like, really? So, so I actually did redeem myself and it's on my social media. I taught him how to dance or so he supposedly thought until he dipped me at the very end, which you don't see. And I was like, you knew how to dance, you punk. <laughs> Just trying to make me feel comfortable. It was really cool. I'll let you in on a secret. Uh, well, he was like, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. We do that sometimes. And he said he didn't know the words to the song and he was supposed to mouth the words to the song. I said, Just watch me. So it was very weird. Halfway through the movie, I'm like, like saying the words to the song to Josh Dumel. And then, yeah, it was, it was fun to redeem myself. And I was like, Okay. Hmm. But we're not allowed to take video or pictures at the time. Yeah. So after I taught him how to dance, I was like, Can you do me a favor, real quick? Can you do that again? <laughs> Can you pretend? Can I videotape it? He's like, yeah. So we did. And the person who videotaped it did like a GIF. So it only did like a few ones. And Oh, no. So you missed the whole. The, the dip at the end. I was, the whole I was pretty pissed. But as, like, I'm like holding on to his jacket for dear life in this video. I'm like, I'm terrified. <laughs> but it was then that I actually learned to talk to superstars without batting an eye. Well, now you're a peer. Well, you know, it takes right? only a few pipes to fall I like over. That. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. I should, yeah. It only takes a few pipes to fall over. A few over. pipes. Like a. <laughs> That's a good move to get him to talk to you, though. Like, it was oh, so no, I bad. Can you help me out? I mean, I could that have played good. that that's, off. That's, that the, old, been that's the old, like, throw the paperwork on the floor like, trick, oh, right? No. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pick it up for yeah. you. Can you help me out, please? 
So, so what are, you know, what are some inspiring words that you want to tell the audience? Like, I, I mean, first of all, my consensus is, is like, you've gone through the military, you've gone through some tremendous adversity, and you've used that to motivate you to get to platforms you never even thought you'd reach before. How do you let them know what to do to pursue their dreams? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you have to find your why for one. Don't let anybody tell you that your personality is, you know, too spazzy or you can't get the job done. Stay yourself, stay true to who you are, because that's one of the things that I had to learn the hard way. Because I was told, oh, you're too spazzy. Oh, no one's going to like you. You're going to turn everybody off. And I just started going, well, if you don't like me, you don't have to like me. So <laughs> this is who I am. This is what I give you. I will never be unauthentic. But I need you to never give up, as cliche as that sounds, but also find out who you are in the process. Like find out what you really are made of. Take that adversity and make it an obstacle to fight and get over and become part of your story. And don't be afraid to tell your story. That's one thing I've learned is the vulnerability when you let people in, it really, really helps other people heal. So if you're needing help with healing, help others heal. Make sure that everybody knows your worth. Don't ever forget who you are. And be true to who you want to become. Where do, you, yeah. where do you want to go? What's next for you? Oh, I want to be global. Uh, that's, mm, yeah. And I, I've said that from day one, and I will never say otherwise. And I've never doubted it. Not one second. Why in the world? No idea. Faith as you may call it. But in a diamond in the rough career field, a needle in a haystack that wins. I just believe I will. And I have ever since. And now I'm being offered amazing opportunities to do so. So watch out, world. I'm coming. Hell yeah. And you're coming fast. Yes, I am. You're coming at them fast. Well, Deanna, that's uh, very inspiring words. And hopefully people take it to heart. Thank you. Fuck and I'm the sure naysayers. they will. <laughs> Don't listen to the naysayers. Say that louder, Christian. Yeah, fuck the naysayers. Don't listen to them. Yeah. I know. Be it's, yourself. It's hard. Love it. to You fight your own internal battles and you hear your own negative talk. It's even worse when it comes from someone else, especially someone you look up to or something. Well, that's yeah. what you got to do, right? Is you got to cut out those negative people in your life. No, oh, yeah. Surround yourself with people better than you. Surround yourself with those with a positive outlook and mindset and work together to go forward. Agreed. And that's, that's outstanding. Well, Deanna, it David. was fantastic having you on the show Thank today. Thank you, guys. Sharing your story. Drinking you, Black Rifle Coffee. Where can coffee? we find you? Woo. Tell these guys where to find you. Go to DeannaWheeler.com. It has all my socials, all my fun stuff, but I really need you on Instagram too. And Spotify, take my song, Whiskey Weather, add it to your playlists because Ooh. it's really fun, actually. It's it going really to number fun. one. It's going to happen. Oh, yeah. Listen, we'll I there. dabble on the guitar. I think we should play a little oh, bit. You yeah. do? I do. I don't think you've ever told me it's that. It's pretty good, too. Oh. It's pretty good. We may have actually hung out before this. <laughs> <laughs> She's using you for your guitar. You're skills. using me for yeah. my skills. When did I meet you, David? When did I meet you? Skyball. When? What year? Oh, that had to be 2017, 2018. Did I play that year? You did. Okay. You did. Yeah. I forget what song you played, though. Firestorm and... That's right. Huh. And we went to the after party and they had the band Oh my the gosh, that band was ridiculous. My goodness. Nonprofit the... work, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. <laughs> it's a lot of drinking and supporting our heroes. Exactly. So. Exactly. It was a fun time. Fun time. Uh, well, Bye. thanks for coming out today. We really appreciate it. And Absolutely. We, re we appreciate you and the message that you give our audience. So. Anytime. And I told you, I will co-host whenever you want to. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. Come on out. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, that has been our show for the day. If you are interested in supporting the Medevac podcast, we don't monetize this show. So go ahead and head on over to medevacpodcast.com. You can pick up a shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie. Uh, we've got some women's cut shirt on there. Grab some logo stuff. And if you enjoy the podcast, please share it with your friends and family. Um, we will see you next time. See you guys next time. Deanna Wheeler, ladies and gentlemen. Bye, y'all.